This is David Diaz, former WBC lightweight champion of the world, and you're listening to The Grueling Truth. Welcome to another episode of the Grilling Truth Tuesday Night Boxing Show, brought to you by Gridiron Mo, a new interactive football app where you get to call what you think the offense or defense should do during a live NFL game and to see what all other fans have called also. Check out Gridiron Mo at www.gridironmo.com. As always, I'm your host for the Tuesday Night Boxing Show, Mike Goodpaster, and I want to welcome in from Ringside Report and Mythical Boxing, Mythical Dave Sidurski. How you doing tonight, Dave? I'm doing great, Mike. How you doing? All right. Well, we didn't schedule a guest for this week because I figured, you know, Dave's the new guy. We'll put him to the test here. So what's our topic tonight, Dave? Um, we're doing the top ten upsets in boxing history. All righty now. So what's your criteria? Is this all time? Um, yes, yes, all time. And, um, yeah, I guess the, the criteria would be as simple as, you know, the, most, the, ten most, <laughs> the ten most unexpected results in boxing. All history. right. We'll start. You want to start it off at number ten? Yes. Uh, my number ten is um, Sugar Ray Leonard um, versus Marvelous Marvin Hagler in April of 1987. Um, Hagler, at that point of his career, you know, in retrospect, he was past it, but we really didn't know how much he was passed at the time. He was still ranked as the top pound-for-pound fighter in the world. Um, He had ruled the middleweight division with an iron fist for over the past seven years. Um, In contrast, Leonard had only fought once in five years, and the last time we'd seen him in the ring, um, Kevin Howard, who was, you know, at best a fringe contender, you know, had put him on his butt and given him a really tough time. Um, So you have Ray Leonard, one fight in five years, moving up in weight to challenge the best fighter in the world, um, the fight sh- seemed like sheer lunacy um, from at least my perspective. And I, you know, at the time, I thought Ray would have a hard time getting to rounds. And um, what transpired was, was very surprising um, with Ray, um, you know, building an early lead, holding his own, and um, winning a razor-thin decision in a fight that he had really no business being in. Um, and I don't think, yeah, I don't think there's, there's you know, I, I don't think anybody has come off that kind of layoff without a tune-up and, and accomplished um, anything similar in boxing history. Well, I agree, and it was an upset. I don't have it in my top ten because I refuse to admit that Sugar Ray Leonard beat Marvin Hagler because I still think Hagler won the fight. <laughs> Uh, I, it's it's arguable. I'll give you that. And it was absolutely brilliant of Sugar Ray Leonard to put that fight off four or five years because I think anywhere between 1982 and 85, I think Hagler breaks him down and beats him. Um, so once again, I'm not disagreeing with you. It's just I don't have it in my top ten, especially it's one of those things in retrospect. Like retrospect, football-wise, you look at Super Bowl III, um, you wonder when you look at the rosters how the Jets – could have been 18-point underdogs against the Colts to begin with. And, I mean, with yes. this, it's the same thing. Hagler was getting a little bit old. Um, like I said, I, I can see why you've got it there. I didn't put it there because it was borderline for me anyways, and I figured we had more fights to talk about if I didn't pick it. I knew it would be in there because you're a big Hagler fan. I was a big Hagler fan, too, and like I said, I have a hard time admitting that he lost that fight. But <laughs> I'm actually a fan of both of them. My number 10 is Leon Spinks beating Muhammad Ali the first time around. I know I think the odds were like 8-1, to one, but I think Spinks was in like his eighth fight. He had a couple fights earlier, had a draw with Scott Ledoux, who you know, we know is my favorite fighter of all time. And Scott Ledoux definitely beat him, I think. But Spinks was 24 years old. He weighed 197 pounds. Um, nobody really took the fight seriously. I think there was only like 5,200 people there for a Muhammad Ali fight. And basically, Spinks out hustled him. I think Ali took him lightly. Um, 
There's an unwritten rule in boxing that a heavyweight champion can't lose his title under decision. And I think what I saw was up until that time, in 1978, the last time that happened was in 1934, I think, when Jim Braddock beat Matt, Max Bear. So I mean, it had been 44 mm-hmm. years, and you knew he wasn't going to get uh, knocked out. And, I mean, really, the only time it looked like Ali was in the fight to me was the last two rounds when he knew he was in trouble and had to do something great. Yes. Yes. Um, I actually, I have that one a little higher on my list. But well, did, see, I, I agree with you. I except. don't just because of the fact Ali was old. You know, and mm-hmm. I think almost anybody that night that was in the top ten probably would have got him. I don't think he trained seriously for it. So, But what you got at number nine? Uh, my number nine is um, James J. Braddock um, over Max Bear, and um, I believe it was 1934 or 1935. Um, Braddock was a 10-to-1 underdog coming into the fight. Um, he had actually retired two years earlier after losing um, 16 of 26 fights. Um, overall, he had a pretty pedestrian record of 46-24-4 uh, and four with 24 knockouts. Um, you know, he came back, he scored three consecutive victories, including an upset over uh, John Henry Lewis. Um, but Bear was um, a much bigger guy, um, a very talented guy, and a very hard puncher. But unfortunately for Braddock, or fortunately for Braddock, rather, um, Maxie didn't always take his training seriously. And it showed on that particular night where um, Braddock just out hustled him, outworked him. Um, avoided his power shots, and won by a decision. And that started one of the more unlikely heavyweight title reigns in, in that division's history. Um, I agree with the fight being on there, but I've got the fight actually a lot higher than that. Okay. Ooh. Ooh. I might have messed something up here. But, <laughs> but um, number nine, I've got... Well, I've got Ali against George Foreman. But, see, there's a problem with that. From looking at my list, I also have Ali, George Foreman at number six. (laughs) So at number nine, I'm going to put Marvin Hagler and Sugar Ray Leonard. (laughs) I've I've educated you. (laughs) You've educated. I put it higher than you did now. But, yeah, like, like I said, with that fight, if it's fought three or four years earlier, I think Hagler dominates it. I still think Hagler should have won the decision. But I'm going to go ahead and go with you there. I knew I left that out somewhere, but for some reason I had two fights in the same one. But that's what happens when you do three shows in one day and get your notes mixed up. But So stuff yeah. happens like that. <laughs> I, I hear you. <laughs> and you just have to, you have to improvise. <laughs> yeah. So um, what's your number eight? Okay, I think you might be a little surprised by this one. Um, I'm going to go back to December 1970 um, when Billy Backus TKO'd Jose Napolis in four rounds. Um, you have Napolis, who is a top five to seven welterweight of all time, in my opinion. He, you know, he was the dominant fighter in that division over the first half of the 70s. Um, he came into the fight with a win streak of uh, 20 fights with um, – victories, you know, over Curtis Cox and Emil Griffith, who are both in the Hall of Fame, and Ernie Big Red Lopez, who was a pretty good fighter. And um, the defense against Bacchus was, um, you know, sort of his, his way of taking, you know, an easy t- touch over, after all those tough fights. Bacchus was rated number 10, and he had a record of 29-10-4. and four. Um, But, you know, unpredictably, Bacchus, you know, he busted him up early in the fight, and he stopped him on cuts in the fourth round. And um, I don't think anybody would have predicted that result for the fight. Yeah, I mean, I don't disagree with it. I never really even thought about that one, to tell you the truth. Um, huge upset. I, Jose Napolese, like I said, or like you said, no doubt was a top ten welterweight all time. Um, did you know Billy Backus was the nephew of Carmen Basilio? Yes, yes. Well, why didn't you bring um, it up? <laughs> <laughs> Would have been a good talking point. But 
<laughs> yeah, and, and, yeah, well, that was good though because it gave me something to say about it too because I wasn't expecting it and I just yeah. remembered that. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, but and I, I believe Napoli's came back and destroyed him in like seven or eight rounds. I think to get yeah. the title back the next year, wasn't it? Yes, and you know that's that's what ends up happening with a lot of these upsets. But you know, the better guy, yeah. um, you know, he digs down and gets more determined the second time around and takes the guy more seriously, and then you really find out. Uh, you know, the are fighters. Yeah. Um, my number eight is Joe Lewis versus Max Schmeling, the first fight. Mm-hmm. I mean, as we talked before, I mean, Joe Lewis was considered everything but the heavyweight champion of the world the first time they fought. And actually, he got the title shot off of losing the fight, if I'm right, against James J. Braddock. Yes, he uh, did. Because of Schmeling, the Nazi, the German thing, and all that. But yes. uh, and, I, and if you remember, it's the fight where when they interviewed Schmeling before the fight, he said that he studied Lewis's style and that he knew how to beat Lewis and nobody knew what that meant. I mean, Schmeling, basically, if you watch that fight, he systematically just kind of broke him down. And as the rounds went by and Lewis suffered various injuries, including his eye, um, Lewis remained busy, just kind of ran out of gas. Schmeling was way ahead on the scorecards. And like I said, I think this was a fight where... Going into it, everybody looked at Joe Lewis as the up-and-coming next big thing, and Max Schmeling was a guy that people considered, you know, on the other side of the hill. Right, right. Um, so Yeah, I, I actually I did not have that one on my list. Um, I was convinced at the beginning of this process that I would, but when I went through and, you know, looked at all the fights and sort of weighed and evaluated it, it felt it fell just outside of my top ten. But well, I can definitely it was under- one that I thought would be in my top four or five and ended up barely making my top ten. Yeah. It is, a lot of these a lot of these are close. Yeah. Seven. Number seven. Um Muhammad Ali versus George Foreman in um, Zaire, Africa, in um, October of 1974. Um, This is one that, in retrospect, really should not have been been a surprise. Um, If you, you know, look back at history, um, Foreman was a crude and limited guy. He had never been in with anyone with the skill sets of Muhammad Ali. Um, He never really had to go beyond more than two or three rounds. Um, but at the same time, he was indestructible, and he had destroyed, um, you know, Joe Frazier and Ken Norton, who were Muhammad Ali's two toughest opponents and two guys that had beat him. So I think this is this is a classic case of uh, just because A beats B, and then B beats C doesn't mean that C or that A will beat C. Um, So Ali, you know, Ali's strategy was surprising. He was expecting the dancing move. He didn't. He stayed stationary. He, uh, you know, he basically waited out George's power, and um, but he counterpunched him silly. And by the eighth round, Big George was done. And um, Ali, you know, we all know what happened after that. Well, see, I think this though. I think that another reason why it was an upset was Ali had been a pro for thirteen, fourteen years and had not looked as great. You know, he had trouble. I mean, he went to distances with guys like Mac Foster, you know, guys like Rudy Lovers stayed in longer than what they should have. And I think it was a big upset because, number one, everybody saw Foreman destroying everything. And number two, Ollie didn't move as much anymore. And right. number three, like I said, I think that everybody considered Ollie on the downside of his career. Yes. I mean, if it's the Ali from 1967, he boxes George's ears off. But it was Muhammad mm-hmm. Ali in 1974, and the thing was this. He knew he couldn't dance anymore that long. So he figured out right. another way to win, which is what makes him the greatest heavyweight, in my opinion. I mean, he figured out ways to win. And if you look at him, even after the Foreman fight, he beat good guys. I mean, the Norton fight was close. Shavers was close. I mean, But the thing was, he still figured out how to beat good guys when he was way past his prime. And I think that's yeah. what made him a great fighter. And I actually, we can combine this because it was my number seven fight also. So, Cool. That worked out pretty good since we agreed. Yeah. yeah I think I'll go ahead and I'll start off with my number six then. 
Mm-hmm. My number six is Jack Johnson against Jess Willard. Boom. Does that surprise you? Um, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Um, Jack Johnson was considered invincible. Jess Willard was a big, crude guy. Um, yeah, I, I think Willard stopped him in like the 26th round. And if you watch what's out there on film of the fight, early in the fight, Johnson controlled it. Um, mm-hmm. There's a lot of people, you know, when Johnson gets knocked out and he's holding his arm over his eyes and everything that think that, you know, the fight was fixed, which it may have been. But even if it was fixed, it was still a hell of an upset. <laughs> 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 but, I mean, Jess Willard, if you watch him, was by no means a great fighter. Um, no. Jack Johnson was a great fighter. And it's one of them things where Johnson, I think, was past his prime. He was over the hill, but nobody realized it yet because nobody had beaten him yet. Right. You know. Right. But um, you agree or disagree? I did not have that one on my list um, simply because I, I, I agree it was it was a great upset. Um, at the same time, I think Jack Johnson was, what, 37 years old, somewhere around there at that point. Um and, you know, still to this, you know, he, he claimed the fight was fixed. So we really, you know, we really don't know exactly what happened. So um, it was one that I just, you know, I thought about briefly, but just didn't ha- end up including in my top ten. Well, and the thing is this, maybe he said it was fixed because he was embarrassed to get his ass whooped by a big white guy that wasn't very good. <laughs> <laughs> that, that could well be true, too. <laughs> so, I mean, either way, there's no proof of it, no matter what he says. I don't think Jess Willard ever said it. And I right. know there's always been rumors about it. But my point to the fight was this. He was old. But if you look at him, I mean, really, and you look at his career, he was still the champion. He'd beaten Frank Moran, Jim Johnson, Jim Flynn right before that. Um, and after he lost to Jeffries, he won, hell, like his next 20 fights. Mm-hmm. 15 to 20. Yeah, he won his next 15 to 20 fights, and then he went on a losing streak, and then he basically retired. But up until then, his fight right before that, he knocked out Jack Murray or Jake Murray in three rounds. He had decision mm-hmm. Frank Moran in 20. So really, he TKO'd Fireman Jim Flynn in nine. So I don't think there was really a huge sign to people that he was past his prime yet. And Jess Willard okay. was not a very good fighter. No, he he was so, he was so a big to me. Dude, I mean, Ali Spinks one is lower because Ali was past his prime and everything. But at least with Leon Spinks, you had a guy that people thought was going to be someday a great fighter. He'd won. He was on the great 1976 Olympic team. I mean, so people could see him being a great fighter someday. I don't think anybody ever really looked at Jess Willard and thought that you know he's going to be a great heavyweight someday. <laughs> that's why to me it's a bigger upset than the Ali when plus the fact that Johnson if you look at his record did not show that he was slowing down and the fact that he won 15 to 20 fights in a row after that tells me that he still had something left it also tells me the fight was probably fixed but anyway. <laughs> what's your number six we'll, ne- we'll never know um, my number six is um, Hasin Rockman um, over Lennox Lewis in 2001. Um, I believe Rockman was something like an 18 to 1 underdog for the fight. Um, he had suffered knockout losses to Oleg Maskeyev and David Tour over the previous two and a half years. At the same time, Lennox had established himself as the best heavyweight in the world with you know nine title defenses, along with his two fight series with the great Evander Holyfield, where he established himself as the clearly superior fighter. And, um, you know, a classic one-punch knockout where, you know, with guys that big in the heavyweight division, one punch can change everything. And it did in that particular case. Um, so we went from who is Hasim Rockman to Hasim Rockman, heavyweight champion of the world. Well, and you don't – did you have Ali Spinks one in your top ten? You had it higher, didn't you? Yeah. All right. Um, my thing with Rockman is uh, – yeah, he lost a couple of fights, but he was 34-2. and two. 
He was ranked top three or four in the heavyweight division. I didn't. I don't have this in my top ten. I can see why it is once again, though. So I'm not like totally disagreeing with you because it's one of the fights that I had out of the fifteen that I pulled off the top of my head, and so I don't completely disagree with it. I think that you've got it awful high, you know, to put it ahead of Ali and Foreman. Uh, the the odds were higher. The, I think I'll leave Foreman. I forget what the odds were. Yeah, but you, the thing you got to gotta remember about odds, though, uh, the odds I think for Ali Foreman were like seven to one or eight to one. Mm-hmm. But on the odds, um, the odds are not picking who they think is going to win a fight. It's who they can get even money or how they can get even money bet on both fighters so Vegas can't lose. And with a guy like right. Team Rockman, there's not going to be many people betting on him anyway. So you got to give extra high numbers. Where with a guy like Muhammad Ali, there's still people that bet him just because he's Muhammad Ali, if that makes any sense. No, no, it does. It does. It, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's like when Mike Tyson of, yeah. fights Buster Douglas, you've got to give stupid odds because nobody's going to on, or nobody's gonna bet on Buster Douglas because, you know, let's face it, nobody really knew who the hell he was except for, you know, guys that really like boxing or watch boxing all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, so, so I'm not going to disagree with you. That was just my argument against, and it's not really an argument it's against. I just think it might be a little bit too high. Okay. Okay. All righty. What's your number five? My number five is um, we're going back to July 1951, Randy Turpin over Sugar Ray Robinson. Um, Sugar Ray came in with a record of uh, 128, 1 and 2, which is utterly mind blowing. Um, he'd won the middle like ninety t- some fights in a row, hadn't he? Yeah, it was. It was yeah, his record was just ridiculous. Um, you know, he'd won the middleweight title over Lamada five months earlier. Um, he was unbeaten over a course of eight over years. eight years. Yeah, yeah. Um, Turpin had beaten some decent fighters, but nobody real anywhere near the class of Ray Robinson. And this was, uh, you know, this was part of a, you know, European tour the by Sugar Ray Robinson, he was, you know, he was going to go over, go overseas and, you know, get all this fanfare. And, you know, he runs into this rough guy that he, he didn't expect. And Turpin, you know, he outboxed him and outpunched him um, en route to a decision win, um, which, you know, the big surprise because Ray Robinson was only maybe, what, 30, I think he was only 30 years old at that point. So still a fairly young guy. Yeah. All right, my disagreement is this. I'll talk about it later. How about that? <laughs> Fair enough. It's higher for me. My number five uh, okay. is Cassius Clay against Sonny Liston. And I mean, what more can you say? Sonny Liston, the, I mean, he was supposed to be destroyed everybody. He was the most intimidating fighter of his day. Uh, at the time, a lot of people considered him maybe the best heavyweight of all time, and if not the best, one of the top three or four. Uh, a lot of guys were afraid to fight him in the ring. Uh, I remember Henry Cooper, who was the British champion at the time, said he would be interested in a title fight with Clay if Clay won, but he was not going to get in the ring with Liston if Liston won. And uh, Cooper's manager, Jim Wicks, I remember seeing an interview, actually said, we don't even want to meet Sonny Liston walking down the same street. Wow. So a, a lot of people did not want to mess with Sonny Liston. And Muhammad Ali, on the other hand, called him out, called him names, got in his head. And I, I believe that Muhammad Ali, Cassius Clay, as, you know, as I like to say, as mommy called him, mama named him Clay, his name's Cassius Clay. But I mean, Clay basically dominated the fight. He had the problem with the liniment, whatever kind of stuff was on Liston's gloves, danced away from him for a while, ended up knocking him out. Another fight that a lot of people might think be fixed because of the mob connections that Liston had. But I think Clay was a 7-1 to underdog. Um, I don't think too many people, including Howard Cosell, thought there was a chance he was going to win the fight. And once again, just like the George Foreman fight with him, he went in against a man that people considered unbeatable, and he knocked him out. And he knocked him out in the seventh round, or he knocked Foreman out in the eighth round. That's what makes him the greatest fighter that ever lived in the heavyweight division. No no argument for me. I actually I have that one higher on my list. All right. What you got at number four? Number four, um, September 1985, Michael Spinks, Decisions Larry Holmes. 
Um, Michael Spinks, you know, after guys like great heavyweight champions like Bob Foster, Archie Moore, John Henry Lewis, um, a bunch of guys tried and failed to move up from light heavyweight to heavyweight and capture the t- to capture the title. And now you get to an era where the heavyweights are much bigger. Um, so, you know, I, for one, had, you know, as great of a light heavyweight as Michael Spinks was, no chance he's going to – no way is a chance against Larry Holmes. Larry is 36 years old. He's a bit – he's past it, but he's still a much bigger guy, and he's still the legit heavyweight champion. Um, so he outweighed Spinks by 22 pounds, um, and – uh, I think that victory was shocking. Um, it showed how quick and versatile um, Michael Spinks was and how skilled he was. Um, and he, you know, he out-hustled and out-quicked Larry Holmes on the way to um, a unanimous decision victory. And that, you know, I, I think Hagler was the fighter, fighter of the year in 85. I think you could make an equal argument for Michael Spinks. Um, based on that accomplishment. Well, I disagree with this fight for one reason. I picked Michael Spinks to win this fight. Wow. <laughs> because, I mean, Larry Holmes, if you remember in 84, I mean, fought Carl the Truth Williams, who was a boxer. He had trouble with him. Um, I don't think mm-hmm. that he took Spinks seriously. I also think that I was like 16 or 17 years old and Michael Spinks was my favorite fighter, which might have had something to do with me picking him to win. Um, actually, if I remember right, it's the last fight that I listened to on the radio. There was actually a radio broadcast of the entire card. I didn't have HBO because wow. I lived in the middle of nowhere in Indiana. So I actually listened to this fight and cheered along like I was seeing it. Um, the other thing I remember about it is after the fight was over, getting a videotape of the fight and seeing Mackie Shillstone. Remember Mackie? Who actually yes, did. did the training program and they did the interval training where he would sprint hard for like... 30, 45 seconds, and then try to get his breath back for 20 seconds. And that's what Mm -hmm. a lot of athletes do nowadays. So that actually revolutionized a lot of the sports training world. And I remember Mackie telling him, you got to learn how to breathe. And, I mean, he's breathing, and he's trying to get his breath back, and they're trying to do it, like, within a minute. And I remember during the fight, from, like, the fifth round on, they'd show him in the ring, and Spanks looked like he's about to die in the corner breathing like that. And you hear, you know, murder. You hear the HBO broadcast crew talking about he's out of gas and got nothing left. And it was right after they showed that's the way he trained and that's the way he breathed to try to get his breath back that quick. But to me, Larry Holmes was an old fighter who just got outboxed that night. I mean, to me, it's very similar. I mean, Michael Spinks was established, one of the greatest light heavyweights of all time. But it was kind of the same thing his brother did to Muhammad Ali. He caught him when he was a little old. He wasn't in shape, and then he just outworked him. And he took that, the that's title. Actually, that's, a good, that's actually a good analogy. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, no one, way am I yeah. comparing Leon to Michael. Michael's one of the greatest fighters that ever lived. Leon is Leon. I mean, Leon was a very talented guy that let other things get in the way. Probably wasn't really big enough to be a heavyweight, especially since he fought or tried to fight more like Joe Frazier than he did his brother. You know, Michael boxed mm-hmm. at that weight. And Michael just outworked Larry. Michael wanted him win Larry that night. And it's one of the few times, I mean, brothers won heavyweight titles, but the thing that's more impressive to me is brothers beat two of the top heavyweights of all time as challengers and beat them bad mm-hmm. enough or easy enough that they got the decision. Yeah, yeah, not easy to do. I mean, yeah. So to me, I mean, it, the fight really didn't surprise me. So fights that happened more recently – are fights that I usually don't rank there. I mean, one more recent fight that I almost put on air that I did was Frankie Randall beating Julio Cesar Chavez. There's an argument for that. I I can see that. Because, I mean, if you remember, Chavez was like 90-0 and at the time. Now, everybody with half a brain knows he got his ass whooped right before that by Pernell Whitaker. (laughs) But, I mean, he was still 90-0. and (laughs) And Randall was only ranked like five or six at best in the world. And Randall came out, out-hustled him, beat him. I know Chavez had a few fouls, but, I mean, to beat Julio Cesar Chavez by decision with Don King controlling everything, oh, that's an upset in, by itself. But Yeah, yeah. No, no argument. All right, so did we do, that was your number four? That was my number four. 
All right. My number four is Gene Tunney over Jack Dempsey. Okay. Same thing. I think if I'd have been alive back then, I'd have been telling people Tunney was going to beat him now. But, <laughs> but, I mean, Jack Dempsey was considered unbeatable at the time. Gene Tunney was basically a light heavyweight moving up. Mm-hmm. You know? I mean, he'd fought some great fights with Harry Greb. Um you know, but I I don't know what else to say about it. At the time, I mean, I think the gate drew like two point six million dollars, and I think there was over like a hundred thousand people at Soldier Field. Uh, was a huge fight, but I mean, let's face it, it was a huge fight back then because it included Jack Dempsey. And right. And if, right. if you watch the film of the fight, Gene Tunney controlled everything. He had the long count. He lost that round. But other than that, I mean. I think he won pretty much every round. I know there was a little bit of controversy there. That controversy had to be snuffed out. They fought a second time. Tunney beat him again. But to me, I mean, Gene Tunney beating Jack Dempsey would be more like a prime Michael Spinks beating a prime Larry Holmes. Yeah, yeah, I actually, I didn't have that on my list. And the only reason I didn't, and I was convinced at the beginning again that I would, was that, Gene Tunney was a great, great fighter. He was yeah, but so was Michael Spanks coming in to fight Larry Holmes. It's the perception, yeah. is what I'm saying. It's just like Tyson Douglas. When you look back at it now, Douglas' style was perfect to beat Tyson. I mean, James Quick Tillis, mm-hmm. who wasn't as quick as Douglas, had given Tyson all kinds of trouble when they fought just a few years before that. So I mean, when you look at it in that context, when you put it like this, when you know the backstory of what happens to the rest of their careers, a lot of these don't look like as big upsets as they were at the time. Now, Ali True. Spinks one is probably even a bigger upset when you look at it because Spinks never really did anything but get it like five or ten. Mm-hmm. But with something like this, I think at the time it was considered basically a light heavyweight against a heavyweight. You know, and, and it was yeah. Jack Dempsey. I mean, in the twenties, it was Jack Dempsey, Al Capone, and Babe Ruth. Right. You know, right, yeah. Red Grange. They were all considered invincible. Yeah, I think. Yeah, and I think, you know, in retrospect, Jack Dempsey was a little overrated, and maybe that colors my view of the fight. Um, I well, certainly. I, I you know, think at the time that maybe Gene Tunney was underrated, Jack Dempsey was overrated. Yeah, I would and agree. Right now, I think. The same thing can be said, that Jack Dempsey is still overrated and Gene Tunney is still underrated. I, I agree totally. I agree totally. I had, um, you know, when we did our top 100, I had I had, tum- I had Tunney well ahead of Dempsey. Yeah, because he was a, I mean, how many times did Gene Tunney lose in the amount of fights he had? Uh, I think he only lost once, and yet you go yeah. back and, you know, you look at um, – there was an NBC sports video that came out like in the late 80s of the 15 greatest rounds of all time, and they had a panel of guys like Don Dunphy, Angelo Dundee, Archie Moore, um, and they asked them all, okay, who was the greater fighter, Dempsey or Tunney? And they all said Dempsey, um, which I, I think completely... Ferdy Pacheco was involved in that too, and anything involving Ferdy Pacheco is bull crap. So... <laughs> <laughs> Because okay, yeah, every at, fight should be stopped the first time somebody uh, gets hit, anyways. Yeah, and I go back and look at the records, and I'm like, what are you guys seeing that I'm not? <laughs> yeah. What am I missing? I mean, here? plus <laughs> the fact that Tony whipped his ass twice. Yeah, yeah. And, and Dempsey uh, never fought a guy like Harry Greb. <laughs> <laughs> no. Harry Greb yeah. probably would have beat Dempsey's ass. Word is he avoided him. Word is uh, De- yeah. you know, so, I mean, his, yeah. the word is Dempsey avoided a lot of people. But, hey, remember, everybody, yeah. real quick, you're listening to The Grueling Truth. You can check us out at ngscsports.com. You can also check us out at www.thegruelingtruth.com. I uh, want to remind you guys that some of the shows coming up this week, we're going to have a show on the top ten inside linebackers in NFL history. Uh, tomorrow we are going to have former Miami Dolphin Pro Bowl lineman Richmond Webb. Thursday night, we're going to have former Houston Oilers great safety Vernon Perry from the Love You Blue Oilers of the late 70s. So make sure you check out all those shows. 
And remember to check out our sponsor, or our main sponsor, which is Gridiron Mo, a new, inter- new interactive football app. Check them out at www.gridironmo.com. You want to do your number three, Dave? Yes. Uh, okay, so now we get to uh, Leon Spinks versus Muhammad Ali, February of 1978. Um, you know, again, in retrospect, you know, a 36-year-old Ali, he was ready to be taken, but by Leon Spinks, a guy who had only seven fights on his resume at the time. Um, Wait a second, though. A dr- he, beat, he knocked out Alfio Rigetti and Alfredo Evangelista. Did he? I, I, Rigetti I was aware of. I didn't realize he had knocked out Yeah, he Evangelista. knocked him out like that. I'm pretty sure he did. That. Okay. Um, but Don't yeah, you doubt get, me. I'll look it up right now. <laughs> fair, fair enough. If you're right, you're right. I won't argue with you on that, but yeah, again, the guy. Well, I may was, not be right. That's why I'm looking it up right now. I want to make sure I'm not okay. handing out false information. Okay, but you know, the, he still only had seven fights on his resume, and you know, he was 30 pounds lighter. He was only 197 pounds. Ali was the icon and legend that was Muhammad Ali, and uh, you know, again, it, it is you know the the way the fight played out. It is somewhat similar to uh, where. Um, you know, Leon was, um, you know, had, was younger. He had a lot more energy, and he just outworked in Ali, who was a lot more spent than we realized. And um, it was really the the one great moment in Leon Spinks' career, and unfortunately his, you know, his life, we know what happened with his life after that. Um, but, yeah, a highly improbable victory over the greatest heavyweight who ever lived. Well, he also his two fights before he fought Ali were a draw against the great Scott Ledoux, and we all know Ledoux won that fight. And he did win that fight if you watch it. Well, you're laughing because I called him the great Scott Ledoux. Uh, I did, yeah, yeah, I am. I am. <laughs> okay, well, knock it off. Uh, all right, okay. um, then he beat Alfio Riquette by a ten round decision. So anybody could see where he was probably going to beat Muhammad Ali. He actually beat Alfredo Evangelista by a knockout in the fifth round, the fight after Harry Cotsia destroyed him in one. Okay. All right. So yeah. he, then he had a draw he, with Eddie the Animal Lopez. Probably his best wins the rest of his career were, if you remember, he fought on the Holmes-Ali undercard against Bernardo Mercado. Yes. He knocked him out in the ninth round, and then... After Holmes destroyed him in three, he became a cruiserweight. And then his best win there was against Jesse Burnett, who, that was 1982. That was five, six years past Burnett's best. Yeah, and that that's where he probably belonged all along. Yeah. And he lost say. to Randall Tex Cobb, too, in 1988. Did you know that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think I with him it was... I actually that fight on DVD. <laughs> <Yeah>. I think <laughs> with, with him it was, a case of, it was a case of too much too soon. Too much success, yeah, too but early. You know and, what? No yeah. matter what we say about him, that man on one night beat Muhammad Ali and became the heavyweight champion of the world. So people who want to make yeah. fun of him need to shut up unless they actually won a heavyweight championship in the world. Sure. Sure. I mean, seriously. I mean, yeah. that one night he did what he was supposed to do. My number yeah. three is the Cinderella man, Jim Braddock, beating Max Bear. Um,. I know that I've got it a lot higher than what you had it, but I mean the fight was basically a boring fight. I mean Bear was coming in; he was supposed to be the guy that had killed people and everything. Um, made for a great movie, uh, except for the part where they made Max Bear look like a bad man, which he definitely wasn't. But it was basically mm-hmm. a fight with Braddock dodging and blocking Bear's punches, especially Bear's big right hand, while sticking his own jab in Bear's face. That's basically how the fight went. It was nowhere near as exciting as the moot look. But, I mean, you got to look. Max Bear was a guy that depression had basically whooped his ass. And he overcame that. So he beat more than just Max Bear. He caught the imagination of an entire country. Um, I don't think that can be shortchanged at all. And, I mean, if you just – the movie was a great movie. Um, I read a few biographies about Braddock, and the movie is – fairly accurate. He was a 10-to-1 underdog. Um, Nobody really thought he had a chance to win. I mean, he's a guy that probably 
uh, biggest fight of his career up to then was he got dominated in 15 rounds by the great Tommy Lofgren for the light heavyweight title, I think, in 1927 mm-hmm. or 28. Mm-hmm. So I, I think it's a guy, it's a fight where the guy came out of nowhere. I mean, he had to retire, I believe, because he broke his hand or something. He gets a depression coming in. And then he comes back. I think he fought Corn Griffith his first fight, who was a guy that was ranked. He was basically thrown in there as a body, and he wanted to make a little bit of money to feed his family. Next thing you know, he knocks out Griffith in two, beats John Henry Lewis, gets a shot at the title. I mean, it's basically damn near the, a, a Rocky movie that was true. Yeah, no no argument that it belongs on the top ten. Um, and Jim Braddock, or James J. Braddock, a great story. Um, he also... Um, you know, he did well on the business end, getting a piece of, uh, you know, after he fought Joe Lewis, he had a piece yeah, of... Yeah, he got like 10% yeah. of all Lewis's future earnings, didn't he? He did. Great business move. <laughs> a tremendous yeah. business move. Yeah. Um, so that's the only not healthy, have... but on the other guy, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the only reason I don't have him a little higher is, um, you know, I look at, this, look at the list of some of the guys that... Um, were upset, and, you know, you see guys like, uh, you know, Ali, Larry Holmes, Ray Robinson, and um, Max Bear, um, ex, you know, excellent fighter, but not, you know, not quite Yeah, but class. see, the thing is this. It's a big upset because of what people thought he was that time. Mm-hmm. You know, they had the big thing, how he supposedly killed two people in the ring and everything, and he ended up, that's one of those in retrospect, Probably not that big of an upset, but at the time, he was considered a killer, basically, in the ring. And James yeah. Braddock was considered a light heavyweight that was washed up, that you know, lucked into a couple wins and was getting a title shot. That's how I look yeah. at it like that. Because it, also, if you compare like Larry Holmes and Michael Spinks, James J. Braddock was nowhere near the resume of a Michael Spinks either, though. Fair point, yeah. You know, so, I mean, to me, it's a huge upset. A lot of it is just because of when the time that it happened was, what the circumstances were around it. You know, it's like the 1980 mm-hmm. Olympic hockey team. The thing that made the 1980 Olympic hockey team so great wasn't the fact that they upset a bunch of pros. It was at the time in history when they did it. You had the, the Iranian hostage crisis. You had the Cold War you know, you had the boy, uh, our boycott of the Summer Olympics. All that was kind of came together to make for the perfect storm for this story that was already so great. It just made it that more mythical, even. Exactly. Exactly. And, yeah, that might be, but, yeah, that that's up there with the greatest um, sports up, upsets in history, um, that yeah. 1980 U.S. Olympic hockey team. Oh, I think that's number one without a doubt. Uh, I, what? That's a discussion we can have for another day, too. Yeah, yeah, I'd have to think about it more, but I, you know, off the top of my head, I can't really argue. <laughs> yeah, well, you can't because it is. All right, let's see. What's your number two? <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Um, my number two is also on your list. Um, it is uh, Muhammad Ali, who at the time was known as Cash Clay, versus Sonny Liston in February of 1964. Um, Sonny was a beast, and he was considered invincible at that point. Um, he'd starched Floyd Patterson in um, one round twice. Um, he's one of the most fearsome sluggers in heavyweight history. And, you know, uh, Cassius Clay, pretty lightly regarded. And um, most experts believe that he was all talk, no action. Um, they equated his cockiness to being scared, and I believe, you know, most of the predictions were listed by knockout in one to three rounds. But um, Muhammad Ali had something a little different in store. Um, he was just way too skilled and way too fast for Sonny Liston. And, um, you know, eventually Sonny, um, Sonny was on his way to be knocked out, and he eventually quit after the sixth round, whether it was due to a shoulder injury or frustration. We, we you know, we don't really know, but... Um, again, one of those one of those cases in retrospect, not that much of an upset, but nobody knew how good Muhammad Ali was going to be at the time. Yeah, I mean, hell, in retrospect, it was a mismatch the other way. Right. 
And my number two, I believe, will probably tie in with your number one, which is Mike Tyson versus Buster Douglas. Uh, 42 to 1 underdog. They fought it in Tokyo, Japan, in front of 30 or 40,000 Japanese people who were obviously asleep because there was no noise made during the fight. Um, <laughs> I, I know there was rumors Tyson was knocked down in his training and everything. I think Robin Gibbons' mom had dropped him once. Um, he had the contractual battles with Bill Caton and promoter Don King. Um, he was still lethal, though, because all that. See, this is the thing I don't get. Mike Tyson fans really irritate the hell out of me. I mean, because a man does not have a prime from 1986 to 1988. <laughs> That's not a prime. That's a guy that was just good against guys that weren't that great for a while. Because the thing is this. Mike Tyson, the fight before this, knocked out Carl the Truth Williams, who was a solid fighter, in 93 seconds. So why was it he could knock out Carl Truth Williams, but he's going to show up a few months later and get beat because of everything is going around? I mean, Buster Douglas was ranked as the seventh-ranked heavyweight by the Ring Magazine. You know, he had mixed success in his career. His previous title fight, he basically quit against Tony Tucker in like the tenth or eleventh round. You know, he had his uh, six consecutive wins, which gave him the opportunity to fight Tyson. Um, he faced a ton of setbacks. See, this is the thing I don't get. You know, Mike Tyson's setbacks were he married the wrong ass woman and he got in bed with the wrong promoter. All right, that's just dumbass stuff to do. Um, you have to overcome it as a great fighter. Douglas, I mean, his mom died 23 days before the fight. You know, additionally, the mother of his son was facing a severe kidney ailment and had contacted him, or had, that she had contracted the flu the day of the fight, which put her health in risk on the day of the fight. So, I mean, people just sit there and say, well, Mike Tyson, you know, he got ruined by these people. Mike Tyson got ruined because he was a mental midget. All right, Mike Tyson did not know how to overcome adversity, which is why he's not one of the 10 or 20 greatest heavyweights of all time. He was just another one of those guys, like a Greg Page and them, that were very talented and never lived up to it. At the time, he was considered King Kong. You know, and King Kong yes. got knocked out by Buster Douglas. But And I know that's probably your number one, right? Yes, that is that is. So my I'm number sorry one. for ruining it for you since I already no, talked about it. But you already no, ruined my I number think, one by talking about it also. So no, I think you said <laughs> most everything that that needed to be said. Um, he was, yeah. I think this is another case of a guy where things came too fast, too easy, and um, he was too, you know, given his issues, he couldn't handle it. But you know, at the time, he looked like it looked like he would reign forever. You know, yeah. Nobody was on the horizon who would beat him. Um, hey, Vander Holyfield. He, yeah, but people didn't realize that at the time. People, I did. You know, pe- I told people, everybody at the yeah. time, if Vander Holyfield was the man who was going to beat him. <laughs> but then again, I was a huge man. See, I know everything, except yeah, for he, like when I picked Manny Pacquiao to beat Floyd Mayweather or <laughs> the time I picked Scott Ledoux to beat Larry Holmes. <laughs> so, yeah, so we'll say you were smarter than the rest of us on this one, but – uh, I've been you know, dumber than the rest before, too, so yeah. <laughs> it goes both ways. Yeah, yeah. so I think, uh, yeah, the fight was off the board um, for all but one of the Las Vegas casinos, I believe, and, yeah, Tyson was like a ridiculous 42-1 to favorite. Um, so I don't think, um, you know, anybody or most anybody watching, you know, expected to see the fight end with, um, you know, Mike on his hands and knees on the canvas you know, trying to put his mouthpiece in backwards. And I mean, <laughs> that was just, that, that was just surreal to watch. Yeah. Cause usually if you think of Mike Tyson on his hands and knees, it's probably Don King behind him. But <laughs> <laughs> that happened to a lot of boxers. So I believe <laughs> uh, my number one, was one you already brought up. I think you had it like number four or five. Mine is Randy Turpin beating Sugar Ray Robinson. I mean, to me, Randy Turpin was probably a little bit better than an average fighter, and he beat the greatest fighter that ever lived. And, you know, Robinson had won like 90 straight fights, hadn't lost in eight years. Nobody saw that coming. Um, Mm -hmm. The story of Randolph Turpin, though, is something that is – really tragic. 
I mean, he, consi- he, he committed suicide after trying to murder his 17-month-old daughter because he had money worries in 1966. Oh. You didn't oh. know that? No, I, 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 knew, I knew about it, but it is... Uh, I'd forgotten yeah, about it. Yeah, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty sad. Yeah, I mean, he was 37 years old at the time. He had recently declared that he was bankrupt after pay, failing to pay a huge tax bill. He shot his little daughter twice and then shot himself oh. in the mouth. Miraculously, oh, the toddler survived the attack. So Wow. Yeah. But, I mean, it, the fact is, either way, this man beat the greatest fighter that ever lived. Would Nobody gave him a chance. I mean, like you said, Robinson was touring Europe fighting non-title fights. The last fight he takes is a title fight against Randy Turpin, and he gets beat. I mean, he proved that it was a complete fluke by just totally destroying Turpin, though, the next year. I think he knocked him out like six, seven, eight rounds and basically put a pretty good ass weapon on him. But that's my number one. Okay. And that was, um, you know, obviously I had that a little lower. Um, but, yeah, the interesting thing about that fight was, um, yeah, now we get to the next phase of Ray Robinson's career where he uh, loses the title four times but regains it four times and he gets beat by some guys but you but know see, you don't want to face... made, that's what made him great though because yeah. unlike mike tyson he, yeah, you might exactly. get him but he was going to come back and he was going to figure out a way to get your ass yeah yeah you know, no way... Ray robinson yeah. didn't have an easy life either and the reason robinson turp is number one to me is you know we talked about retrospect whether a fight looked like it was an upset in retrospect or not this is the one fight that at the time was a com- tremendous upset and right now, when you look back at it, it, may even be a bigger upset. Agreed. 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 So that, that's Robinson. why it's my number yeah. one, because Tyson yeah. Douglas, when you look 20 years after the way their career, the way Tyson's career ended up, it's not really a shocking surprise that he went out unprepared and got his ass whooped by somebody that should have never beat him. Because that's kind of, you know, he's got a bunch of losses on his career like that. I mean, even the fights at the end of his career. I mean, you don't lose to Kevin McBride and Brian Nielsen, even if you're 100 years old, if you're halfway decent. <laughs> but. Yeah, that's, I guess that's why we don't rate fighters historically until after they've retired. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, when you rate these, this is the one fight to me that when you look back at it, I mean, there's a few other ones like that too, but to me this one is even a bigger upset when you look at it now, when you look at the history of the two fighters, what happened after, what happened before, all the way around to me. I know that 99% of the people in the world will say Tyson Douglas. Tyson Douglas was a huge upset at the time. It's still an upset now. Turpin Robinson was a huge upset at the time. It's a huge upset now. Yeah. If that makes any sense to you. Yeah, and, you know, a year later, um, the only, you know, he Ray Robinson almost captured the light heavyweight title over Joey Maxim, and it wasn't Maxim that beat him; it was the 104 degree heat. <laughs> and that always bothered me too, because it was 104 degrees for Maxim too. But yeah, Maxim was um, <laughs> yeah, Ma- Maxim was a good 15, 16 pounds heavy. Ray Robinson only weighed 157 for that fight, I believe. Yeah. But all right, I thought that was an interesting show. What do you think? Great, yeah, great, and um, yeah, for there are, you know, it's, it's always tough to narrow this stuff down to ten. Yeah, I mean, there's more. Like I said, to me, Frankie Randall and Chavez was a huge upset. That was a huge upset. Um, Dempsey Tunney, which you had on your list, uh, you know, something like John Tate versus Mike Weaver. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you could go on and on with this. Well, Donald Curry the John Tate versus, Mike yeah. Weaver thing was an upset in the 15th round because the first 14 rounds have been an ass beating. I think going into the fight, I don't know if it was that big of a – I mean, I don't think that fight was considered completely one-sided just because Weaver – Weaver fought Holmes before that fight, right? He fought him in 79? He, he did, but, yeah, Tate was undefeated. Yeah, but Weaver had also knocked down Holmes, so I don't think it was, like, tremendous. But I think it was an upset. I remember yeah. being really excited, though. Yeah. Because it was like a great, do- great one-punch yeah. knockout. I think there was like 40, 45 seconds left after he'd lost every round up until that point. Yeah. 
Yeah, when, but, and Don, John Tate was never the same after that. Or, yeah, like a Don Curry versus a Lloyd Hunnigan. Uh, yeah. So Let's what are you go. working on for your next ringside report story? Ah, I've um, – there's, there's some interesting stuff going on, um, but I'm going to keep those under my hat for now and encourage people to – Oh, so basically you haven't thought of it yet, but you're trying to tease everybody like you might have something good. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's all right. And then tell everybody about your mythical boxing on the Facebook. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, so you can visit me on, um, I have a group called Mythical Boxing on Facebook, um, which um, you know, revolves obviously around mythical dream boxing scenarios. I also have a website called Mythical Boxing at Weebly's, W-E-E-B-L-Y-S dot com, um, where you can see my top 100 series, um, the full edition. And, yeah, feel free to visit me on ringsidereports.com. And also, um, I have a byline on Newsbreaker, which is affiliated with Ringside Reports. All right, is that all you're doing? <laughs> <laughs> hey, remember, yeah, guys, you, you want, can check. Uh-huh. Yeah, you don't want the full laundry list. <laughs> um, you can check us out. Remember, ngscsports.com. Um, you can also check us out at www.thegruelingtruth.com. You can follow me at rivermonster11. Um, go like our Facebook, our Facebook page, our Facebook group page, which is just The Grueling Truth. You punch that in a search, it comes right up. Um, we will be back next Tuesday night with another boxing show. We might even have one in between. You never know. Um, tomorrow night, former Miami Dolphin Richmond Webb. Thursday night, former Houston Oiler Vernon Perry. Um, got any closing words, Dave? Um, great time tonight, Mike, as always. And, um, you know, great, great discussion and great, great debating with you. Yeah, it's always a good time. So you'll have to, you'll have to think up the next one too now. I'm going to put you in charge of that. you got to come up with some extra topics. And, you know, remember you're supposed to try to get me James Quick tell us too. Yeah, we can. <laughs> told me you could hook yeah. that up, Dave. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking now you can see the smoke. Well, you're not here, so you can't see the smoke. But, you know, it's coming out my ears and. <laughs> well, you're from Massachusetts, so it's hard to tell what that smoke is, too. So, oh, oh hell yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we get we get forest fires every. I live near the woods, so somebody you know, always you know lights the woods on fire, so we get that smell at night too. <laughs> yeah, what the hell? So, hey guys, for Dave Sadursky, I'm Mike Goodpaster. We'll talk to you next Tuesday night on the Boxing Truth Hour, Boxing Truth for Grueling Truth, Grueling Truth Boxing Hour. Took a while for me to get that out, all right. (laughs) But we'll check you out next Tuesday night, everybody. So check back with us then. We will talk to you next week on the Grueling Truth, where the legends speak.